Okay, so a lot of times I will have problems like this up on the board for you when you come in to give you something to get started on. Um, let's take a look at the first one here. What did you guys get for dimension A? Six. Okay. So to do that, dimension A is a horizontal dimension, which means we can only look at other horizontal dimensions. So we have the 12 and the 18. And when you look at them, there's got to be one of three relationships between dimensions. Either two dimensions have to be equal to each other, two dimensions have to add up to a total, or two dimensions have to subtract to make a common difference. When we look at this one, it's pretty obvious that the A and the 12 have to add up to 18. So that means we just subtract 18 minus 12 gives us 6 for A. What did you get for B? 8. Good. Same thing. B is vertical, so we can only look at other vertical dimensions. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that the 16 and the B must add up to the 24. So 24 minus 16 gives us 8. Now, if this is a concept you're struggling with, um, for your programs, it's not as important as it would be for like CNC or welding or construction, where you have a lot of blueprint reading. But looking at schematics and stuff like that, it is still a skill that that's very useful to have and it does come up. But it's also one that a lot of people do struggle with. So if it's something you have questions on or you're not getting, don't be afraid to, to ask me and I'll go over it with you a little bit more. So the second one here is a little bit more complex. What did you guys get for dimension C? Four. Perfect. Here again, it's a vertical dimension, so we can only look at other vertical dimensions. But now we have a total of five of them. So to look at the relationship, what we find is these three vertical dimensions have to add up to the same thing as these two. Because they both go from the bottom of the part all the way up to the top of the part. So 34 and or 32 and 4 make 36. These three must also add up to 36. So you take that 36, you subtract the 26 and the 6, and you're left with 4. How about for D here? What'd you get? 10. Perfect. Same thing. We have that's a horizontal dimension, so we're looking at the other horizontal dimensions. And we find that these three have to add up to the same as these two. So 12 plus 6 plus 8 is 26. 16 and D must add up to 26. So we subtract 16 to get 10. The third one here, finding M, is about the same type of problem. What do you get for M? 10. Perfect. Same thing. Vertical dimension. We look at the other verticals. And we see that these three, the 12, 6, and the M, have to add up to the 28. So we subtract it down to 10. N is a little bit more complicated here. It's horizontal. We're going to look at the other horizontals. What did you get for N? 18. Perfect. Here, I mean, there are some ways you could do it. You could compare, you could maybe find this dimension from here to here and then add it to the 12 is one way to go about it. Um, it's like I pointed out last class. There's more than one one correct process will get you the correct answer. So that's one way. If you look at this as 20 and 26, the difference here has to be 6 inches. So this dimension has to be 6 inches longer than the 12 to give you the 18. Another way it could be done is you could look at finding this dimension across here, which is going to be the same as this one here. So you're basically breaking it down into two separate rectangles, one here and one down here. This third rectangle is just being used to transfer the dimensions. So if I do it that way, this is just 12. The 20 minus 12 gives me 8 inches there. So this one's 8 inches as well. So then you know the n and the 8 add up to 26, so you subtract to get 18. Anybody having questions on problems like that? Okay. Now if I were to ask you to do something like find the perimeter... All it's asking you to do is to find the distance around. In other words, add up all the sides. So on a problem like this, you would start out with 18 plus 24 plus the 12 plus the 8 plus the 6 plus the 16. 
and you would add all those up, should add up to 84. Now on a problem like this, there's a shortcut. Because these sides here, this here and this here, are the same as what it would be if I just popped this out to be a full rectangle. That side would be there, that side would be there. I can just do 18 plus 24 to get 42 and double it. When I just did this one, I didn't actually add up those six dimensions that I wrote down. I just did the 18 plus 24 and doubled it. Could I do the same thing on this problem here? If I pop this corner out, let me get a different color. If I pop this corner out, does it do these dimensions still apply here and here? Yeah, they do. If I pop this corner out, will these dimensions transfer down to here? Yep. And these dimensions will transfer over. So I could use that shortcut on that problem. Because all those dimensions can just be slid over to make it just a regular rectangle. So I could just find the total width, total length, total width, add them together and double it. On this one, would that work? No. no, because it doubles back on itself. It actually has an indent. It's not just folding in corners anymore. There's actually a notch out of the side. So on this one, you can't do that. You actually do have to go through and add up all of the separate sides. Now, you can do a little bit of a shortcut because, you know, these three here have to add up to the 28, don't you? So you could do 28 in place of those three because you know that has to total up. But you have to add in these ones separate. Okay, well, yesterday we went over adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing numbers. Um, one question that's in your homework that often comes up, Problem like this. For those of you in automotive, you're going to see problems like this a lot later on in the semester. Um, for egg or for dairy, um, you're probably not going to see them too much, but the concept is something that's good to have. You get into industrial wiring and stuff like that, like doing barn cleaners or anything that runs off a different voltage. You get into three phase wiring for some of your heavier equipment now. I realize you probably won't do a lot of that yourself anymore because code says you have to have an electrician come in, but if you need to do any minor repairs, the concepts still apply. So looking at this as being a series circuit, one of the types of problems they had is if you have 20 ohms, 35 ohms, 80 ohms, and 45 ohms, what is the total resistance? Well, all that's asking you to do is add up those four numbers. If we add them all up, we're going to get 180. And that symbol, that upside down horseshoe kind of thing, is just the symbol for ohms. So all I really need at this point are the numbers. I'm not worried about the labels. Did anybody have any other questions off the homework as they were working through it? Okay. So our new material for today. Page 65, okay, let me grab that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this one with a little bit easier numbers rather than mixing feet and inches. I'm going to do an example that's just similar to it, but straight inches. So let's say that this is 240 inches all the way across here on this wall. Now we're going to put in four windows. We're going to pretend those are the same size. And that the size of each window is going to be 30 inches across. So they're all the same. And then the spacing between each of them, we're going to put this at 18 inches. So what we want to find is what's this spacing here on each side. So we know that this is 30. So this is what I'm looking for is this missing piece. I know this is 30. This is 18. This is 30, this is 18, this is 30. Obviously not drawn to scale. 18 and 30. And this is another one of our missing pieces. So those are the two missing pieces that we have to find. We are told that they're equal. That's what I, that's how I thought I had to draw it out like that. Yeah. Piece of paper and find that they know. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the 30s. 
Actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to multiply 30 times 4, because there's 4 of them is 120. I'm going to add up my 18s. There's 3 of them, so 18 times 3 is 54. That gives me a total of 174. To find out what's left over then from my 240, I subtract my 174, it gives me 66 inches. <coughs> These two pieces add up to 66 inches, so I'm just going to divide by 2 to give it each of them is 33 inches. And that's the hard part. The wording, you gotta, you have to go through and figure, okay, equally spaced, same size windows, same distance on each end. But by same distance on each end, does it mean this is equal to the spaces, or what do they mean? But you got to figure out that, yeah, this, this space and this space are the same, but different from any of the other dimensions that are given. And then go from there. You're right, drawing. I like to draw a lot of pictures. It tends to keep me from making some silly mistakes. Okay, so for our new material today, we're going to step back just a touch. So yet last class, we looked at adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing these large numbers. I want to take a look at what it actually means. What, what does it mean to combine the values? So we're going to set the labels aside for now, the, the names aside for now, and we're just going to look at the values. For adding 5 plus 3, what does it mean? How do we add them? Well, we've done this enough in our life that we just know 5 plus 3, of course, equals 8. We don't really have to think about it too much. I mean, you may go back to what we were first taught of make 5 sticks and 3 sticks, and now you got count them up, you got a total of 8 sticks or whatever, which is a pretty decent illustration, or counting them on your fingers or whatever. But what does it, the technical definition of math of combining those values of 5 and 3? Well, in math, a lot of our functions come down to a number line. So we showed you the number line when it came down to rounding, um, our greater than and less than stuff all comes off the number line and all that. So if we're looking at the number line for combining values, first thing we have to do is look at how do you represent values on the number line. So to represent a 5 on the number line, there are a couple of different ways it can be done. One is we can just put a dot at 5. That's a great way to represent that value if all we're concerned with is what its value is and we're going to compare it to other values. But if we're going to do an operation with it, that's not a, a terribly useful representation. Another more useful way of representing a value is something called a vector. Now that's a really fancy word for a very simple concept. What a vector is, is it's just an arrow that starts at 0 and goes to that value. Now that vector can be moved anywhere on the number line and it still has the same value. It's 5 units long and it points in the positive direction. If I move it here, well it goes from 4 to 9, it's still 5 units long and it still points in the positive direction. So it still represents a 5. So to do my 5 minus 3, or 5 plus 3, I should say, I have my vector for 5 and my vector for 3. To add those together, the property of, or the operation of addition means physically combining or putting them together. I move the 3 or the 5, whatever, so that they're end to end. Now they give me a total length of 8. Now again, it might seem kind of tedious to do that because we all knew that 5 plus 3 equals 8. We didn't really need to draw out arrows and number lines and stuff like that. Well, the reason I'm doing this right now is because our next step is going to be looking at not 5 plus 3, but 5 plus a negative 3. Just a quick note on the parentheses there. Uh, most of us are used to parentheses, meaning that you have to do something first. Um, another use of parentheses is just to separate and clarify. Here, those parentheses are there to, to make you certain that that's a negative 3 and not minus 3. You're not subtracting, it's a negative. So 5 plus a negative 3 requires that we represent a negative 3 here. 
Well, that's a, just a vector. It's the same length as the positive 3. It just goes in the opposite direction. It goes in the negative direction. So when we combine that with the 5, we can see the two of them go together, end up at positive 2. So 5 plus a negative 3 is a positive 2. You do the negative 3 and then plus 5 like that. Yeah. That's just fine. When you're adding, you can change the order of the numbers. Now, you have to be careful. When you're subtracting, you cannot change the order. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. Now, I don't draw out number lines whenever I add with the negatives. These are called integers, by the way. So far, what we've looked at was whole numbers. Whole numbers are, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. They just don't include decimals or fractions. Integers are the whole numbers and all the negatives. But again, no decimals or fractions involved. Now, when we're dealing with negatives or integers, the number line is helpful, but I'm not going to draw out a number line. I don't expect you to draw out a number line every time you go to work with a negative number. But I do keep this picture in my mind when I'm doing it. If I have something like a negative 27 plus 14, what I'm thinking is this. Here's 0. Negative 27 goes in the negative direction, so it's to the left. Positive 14, does that go the same direction or the opposite direction? It's positive, so it's going to go the opposite, right? So before I draw it in, the next question I have to ask is, is 14 longer or shorter than 27? Bigger or smaller? It's going to be smaller, right? So it goes the opposite direction, but it's shorter, so it's going to look like that. So what this image tells us is two things. First of all, we end up on the negative side of zero. So my answer is going to be negative. The second thing it tells us is since the arrows go in opposite directions, the value is the difference in the ori original values. What's the difference between 27 and 14? 13. So the answer to that is a negative 13. So you don't have to draw out the number line, but having that little picture of the vectors helps us figure out what to do. I might have negative 18 plus a negative 9. So if I draw out a picture, here's 0. Negative 18 goes to the negative direction. Negative 9 goes the same or the opposite? Same direction. They're both negative. And it's going to be shorter. The length really doesn't matter since they go the same direction. This again tells me I'm on the negative side of 0, so my answer is negative. Am I looking at for combining the values or the difference between the values? Combining. The arrows point in the same direction, so I'm combining the values. 9 and 18 make 27, so it's negative 27. I have 42 plus a negative 68. Start at 0. Here's 42. goes in the positive direction. Negative 68. Same direction or opposite? Opposite. Shorter or longer? Longer. 68 is bigger than 42. So it goes longer. So this tells me that I'm on the negative side of 0 again. Is it combining the values or the difference between them? Difference because they go opposite directions. So it doesn't matter which order I subtract. I'm going to take the bigger one minus the smaller one. 68 minus 42 is 26. So it's a negative 26. Any questions? When you think of addition that way, dealing with the negative numbers is pretty simple for addition. It's just either you're going to add the values or you're going to subtract the values, and then the picture tells you which one, whether it's positive or negative in your answer. Where it gets to be trickier is when we deal with subtraction. So let's look at a subtraction with positives. 8 minus 3. Now, of course, all of you can look at that and say, well, 8 minus 3 is 5. We know that answer. But let's look at how we would draw that out on the number line. If we're going to represent that with vectors, there's 8. Subtract 3, we end up at 5. If we look at that picture there, though, what is different between that picture and the picture for 
8 plus a negative 3? It's kind of a trick question. There's nothing different. It's the same picture because it's the same problem. There are several different definitions for subtraction out there, but one of the definitions of subtraction is a form of addition, that it is adding the opposite. One definition for that symbol is add the opposite of whatever comes after it. So here it's subtract 3. What that's saying is add the opposite of 3, which is negative 3. Does that make sense? So if I change my subtraction to addition, then I'm back to those vectors I did for addition. Now problems like this where both numbers are negative or both numbers are positive, I wouldn't change it because I know how to subtract positive numbers. But if I have negative 18 minus 13, I'm not so sure how to subtract that one. So if I look at this, I'm going to say this is add the opposite of 13, is what that's telling me. So it's negative 18, add the opposite of 13, which is a negative 13. Now that I have it like that, I know from 0, I go negative 18, negative 13 goes the same direction. That is a negative, combining the values gives me 31. Make sense? The example that always starts to stump people is this one. Twenty-one minus a negative eight. Most people want to go for thirteen here, but we have to remember we're going to change this to plus the opposite. This is twenty-one. This is saying add the opposite of this number. So I'm going to add. What's the opposite of negative eight? Positive eight. Yeah, just eight. So 21 minus a negative 8 is just 21 plus 8. I don't even have to do the vectors for that. I know that it is 29. 21 plus 8. Or I might have negative 16 minus a negative 32. Again, I'm going to change this. The negative 16 doesn't change, but this is saying add the opposite of this. So I'm going to add what? Positive 32. The opposite of negative 32 is a positive 32. So now the... Yep, go ahead. That's basically... When there's two negatives in front of each other, that's basically canceling each other out making it a positive. Most of the time, but I caution against, you know, making... Because you know, everybody wants to demonstrate two, two negatives make a positive. Not always. I mean, two negatives do affect each other. When you're multiplying, two negatives become a positive. If you're subtracting a negative, it becomes adding a positive. But it doesn't always mean your answer is positive. So I, I caution that just a little bit. You've got to be careful with it. That's all. But yeah, there is truth to that statement if you apply it in the right situation. So here we have the negative 16. Then we're adding a positive 32. So it's longer and it's in the opposite direction. So we end up positive. And the difference between them is 16. Here's why I cautioned you on that last example. You can have one like this. Negative 23 minus a negative 9. So that's going to become negative 23 doesn't change, but plus the opposite of negative 9 is a positive 9. So our picture here is negative 23, positive 9. We're still on the negative side of things, and it's the difference between 23 and 9 is 14. So you get a negative 14. So many people say, well, it's a double negative, so it's got to be a positive. Yeah, the double negative part becomes positive, but the answer still can be negative. That's what I meant. Yeah. And I knew that's what you meant, but I wanted to make sure I went through that. because That is something a lot of people mess up. They see two negatives together. And also, you got to be careful because... That, of course, is going to equal a negative 25. But here at all times, doesn't two negatives make a positive? No, only in, the, only in the correct situation, only when they're in the right place do they make a positive. Here, when you're subtracting a negative, yes, the two negatives make it plus a positive. 
but this case does not. I'm just, I'm very cautious about giving out general rules. That's why I went on, kind of launched into a little lecture on that. All right, so the big thing with subtraction is just to change it into addition, adding the opposite of that number that's being subtracted. For multiplication, we looked at this a little bit. The definition of multiplication, 5 times 3, is repeated addition. That's saying take three fives and add them together. 5 plus 5 plus 5, which is 15. So if I have negative 5 times 3, it's not much of a stretch to say negative 5 plus negative 5 plus negative 5. Your book always puts parentheses in them if they come set around them, if you come second, just so you know that that's a negative 5, not minus 5. And if I add together negative 5 plus negative 5 plus negative 5, I get negative 15. Now, I've always been taught that you're just going to... I just lost something. What did I lose? I'm not sure what it was here. Okay. We've always been taught a negative times a positive is going to equal a negative. A little bit trickier to comprehend is this one. 5 times a negative 3. In fact, you could write it without the, the times in there. You could just do 5 parentheses negative 3. means five, 5 times negative 3 as well. Whenever you have a number outside the parentheses with no symbol, that is multiplication. 5 times a negative 3. Well, how can I take negative 3 5s and add them together? I can't, can I? I can't add 5 to itself negative 3 times. So what we do is we use the fact that when we multiply, just like we had said when we add, we can change the order of the numbers. When we multiply, we can change the order of the numbers. So I can put the negative 3 first and do negative 3 times 5. Now, all that's saying is I'm having 5 negative 3s added together. So negative 3 plus negative 3 plus negative 3 plus negative 3 plus a negative 3. Which, of course, adds up to negative 15. Again, you've always been taught positive times a negative is a negative. And then we all know this one. Negative 5 times negative 3 has to be what? Positive 15. We were always taught negative times a negative is a positive. This is another one of those double negatives make a positive situations. The question is why? Somewhere along the line, fifth, sixth grade teacher said so, right? If we look at our definition of multiplication, like we did up here, this can't even be done. I can't take negative 5 and add it to itself negative 3 times. If I switch the order, I can't take negative 3 and add it to itself negative 5 times. It doesn't work. Our definition of multiplication breaks down here. So what we do, and that happens a lot of times in math, our basic definition breaks down for a certain situation. So what we do is we look for a pattern. If I start with negative 5, if I multiply by a positive 3, what do I get? Negative 15. So I'm going to keep the negative 5, I'm going to change the 3 to a 2. Negative 5 times 2, I get negative 10. I'm going to keep going now. I decrease that by 1, so I'm going to decrease it by 1 again. Negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. Now I'm going to look for a pattern. Here, I, when I started with a negative 5, if I reduced what I was multiplying by by 1, what happens to my answer? Yeah, it, it increases by 5 in this case, since we started with a negative 5. This goes down by 1. This increased by 5. Well, let's test to see if that holds. If I keep my negative 5 and I reduce this by 1 again, what would it be? Reducing that by 1 to make it a 0, right? What's negative 5 times 0? Zero? 0. Anything times 0 is 0. Did our pattern hold? Did this go up by 5 again? Sure did. So we're going to assume that pattern is going to continue. I keep my negative 5 here. If I reduce this by 1 again, it's going to be now times negative 1. This has to go up by 5, which would be a positive 5. Negative 5, we're going to reduce this to a negative 2. This would have to go up by 5 again to be a positive 10. Negative 5 times negative 3 has to go up by 5 again to be a positive 15. 
This is why a negative times a negative is a positive. Why can't you be a teacher? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's something, it was my, I didn't even understand this. I've been very good at math my whole life, and I didn't understand this until a few years after I started working here and started concentrating on why things happen. Um, they don't teach this anymore. Most of your, your high school math teachers have never even seen it done this way. So basically what we can see here is if I have a negative times a positive, my answer is going to be positive or negative. Negative. And then I just do the 3 times 7, which is 21. So negative 21. If I have a positive times a negative, my answer is going to be positive or negative. Negative, 9 times 5 is 45, so it's a negative 45. And if I have a negative times another negative, my answer is going to be positive or negative. Positive, and 8 times 2 is 16, so we have positive 16. Division, now... Division can follow that same rule, but I'm going to show you where that rule comes from quick. Division, if I have 15 divided by 3, we said that division and multiplication are the same operation. They're just one's going forward, one's going in reverse. The definition of 15 divided by 3 equals blank is really this question. Blank times 3 equals 15. Well, we know that 15 divided by 3 equals 5. 5 times 3 equals 15. It checks out. If I throw in the integers, the negatives, if I have a negative 21 divided by 7, well, if I look at that here, blank times 7 equals a negative 21. To get a negative answer here, I have to have one positive times one negative, don't I? The 7 is positive, which means this number has to be negative. Which we know it's going to be a 3. 3 times 7 is negative 21. So this result is a negative 3. A negative divided by a positive equals a negative. Let's start out with something like 18 divided by a negative 3. Let's see what that has to be. Well, if I go over here, this is saying what times a negative 3 equals 18. Well, we know the numerical value is 6, but 18 is positive, which means we either have to be multiplying two positives or two negatives. The negative 3 is already negative, which means this one must also be negative to get a positive result. So this is a negative 6. For that reason, when you take a positive divided by a negative, the result is negative. What if I have negative 36 divided by a negative 4? Well, again, we're looking at this situation over here. Blank times a negative 4 equals negative 36. For two numbers to multiply to be a negative, we must have one positive and one negative. This one's negative, so this one must be positive. 36 divided by 4 is 9, so it has to be a positive 9. So for that reason, a negative divided by a negative is a positive. Now you look at it, the rule is exactly the same as for multiplication. If both signs are the same... The result is positive. If one's positive and one's negative, no matter what order they're in, the result is negative. Just the reasoning behind it's a little different because it's the reverse of multiplication. It just turns out to be the same. So if I have 32 divided by negative 8, is my answer going to be positive or negative? Negative. And 32 divided by 8 is 4. If I have negative 27 divided by negative 9, is my answer going to be positive or negative? Positive. Negative divided by negative is a positive. And I get 3. 27 divided by 9 is 3. 
Or if I have a negative 45 divided by 5, is my answer going to be positive or negative? negative? Negative. A negative divided by positive is a negative. 45 divided by 5 is 9. So we get a negative 9. Now there's going to be some consequences of this when we start looking at powers and stuff like that as well. Um, give you a little foreshadowing. What's that symbol mean? Squared, right? That means 5 times 5. 5 times itself. That number times itself. It's 25. What's negative 5 squared? It's also 25. It's a negative 5 times a negative 5. And a negative times a negative is still a positive. Because of that, any number squared will be a positive. So we'll look at powers in more detail coming up in the next couple of weeks. But that's just something to point out because when you multiply any numbers with the same sign, any two numbers with the same sign, the result will be positive. Anything squared then will be positive. Okay, we're jumping ahead in your book a little bit, but I wanted to get the integers out of the way because it makes it much more useful to do some of our other stuff. So in your book, on page 111, Problems 1 through 39, the odd. Look at adding and subtracting with our integers. Um, page 111. And you got to look, there are, on those pages there are some actual example problems given earlier. You have to do the one that are labeled exercises. I think that's like exercise 14.1 or 14.2 or something like that. I don't remember what chapter <laughs> it is. Then on page 114, 1 through 35, the odds. Have some more. And again, look for the exercises, not the example problems. And page 116, 1 through 39, the odds are just calculation. But then there's some word problems on 51 through 79, the odds. Get you used to reading them out of a, a word problem. Just like before, if you do the first couple and they seem incredibly easy, feel free to skip ahead to the more difficult ones. I realize there are a lot of problems here. There's about 70 problems here. I don't want you to sit there and have to crank through all 70 of them if you, if you already got it, if you know how to do it. Well, we won't have class again until Tuesday. But again, like I said, you don't have to do all of them. You're not going to turn them in. Do as many as you need to to feel comfortable taking your quiz. Possibly Tuesday. For those of you wondering, that's my way of saying there's a quiz on paper. Okay. Okay, you guys have the last nine minutes to get started on your homework and ask questions if you need to.